Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Captain Kristen Dorfman, and I serve as the Operations and Policy Attorney for the Army Special Victims Council Program. I am both a former and current SVC, and it is my honor to serve as your narrator for today's commemoration ceremony. I welcome you today to the 10th anniversary commemoration of our Army's Special Victims Council Program. With us today to recognize this occasion, we are honored to have with us Lieutenant General Walter Pyatt, Director of the Army Staff, Ms. Denise Council Ross, Principal Deputy General Counsel, Major General Joseph Berger, Deputy Judge General, Mr. William Kuhn, Director, Civilian Personnel, Labor and Employment Law, Ms. Karen Carlisle, Director, Soldier, Family and Legal Services, Dr. Nate Galbraith, Deputy Director, DOD SAPRO, Mr. Dwight Sullivan, Senior Associate Deputy General Counsel, DOD OGC, Command Sergeant Major Michael Bostic, who I've not seen. There he is. Regimental Command Sergeant Major. Brigadier General Timothy Rieger, Principal Deputy General Counsel, Office of the General Counsel. Brigadier General David Mendelson, Chief of Military Law and Operations. Brigadier General Rob Borcherding, Legal Counsel to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And Brigadier General Jackie Thompson, Jr., Chief Defense Counsel, Office of Military Commissions. We are also proud to welcome members of the JAG Corps family here today, including current and former chiefs and deputies of the Special Victims Council program, former and current SVCs, as well as colleagues across the fields of military justice and legal assistance. At this time, the Judge Advocate General, Lieutenant General Stuart Risch, will make some remarks. Well, good afternoon. There you go. We like to see that. So the only bad thing about a ceremony like this and having the director of the Army staff join us is he sees how many general officers we actually have in the JAG Corps. I guarantee you by next week we'll be about four lighter than we are right now. So uh, no, not at all. Uh, hey, today is a wonderful day. Uh, thank you, Kristen, for that gracious introduction. As Kristen stated, she is a member of the SVC office program team and a current and former uh, Special Victim Counsel. But I'll tell you, if you haven't had a chance to work with her, she's also a stellar young officer, a mentor, and an up-and-coming leader in our JAG Corps. I had the great fortune to travel with her and to spend a significant amount of time on a recruiting trip up to Syracuse University Law School. Uh, and that reminded me yet again that the future of our regiment is in extremely capable hands. It's the best of hands possible, given the young lawyers and leaders like Kristen. Our regimen and the SVC program are blessed to have a litany of similarly skilled advocates within our ranks. Given that and what our SVC program has accomplished over the last decade, I am, and I mean this sincerely, extremely proud to be here today to help celebrate this 10-year anniversary and all that our SVCs have achieved during that time in support of and on behalf of all of their clients. I will tell you that General Pyatt had the exact same reaction with me when he heard this was the 10th anniversary. We cannot believe how quickly that time has gone by. It seemed like we were just starting it. I think what he was also feeling is he became the director of the Army staff around that same time <laughs> and has stayed do doing that since then. And both of those programs have been extremely successful. And what he, do what he doesn't know is he's staying as long as the SVC program will be in existence. So I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I don't want to spend too long plowing the same ground uh, that Kristen plowed. I do want to welcome all of our visitors, our team, our leadership team, uh, uh, extended is here as well as with our general officers, our one stars. But I'd like to, to specifically recognize Ms. Denise Council Ross, Principal Deputy General Counsel for the Army General Counsel's Office here in her own right and certainly on behalf of Ms. Ritchie. We've got a great relationship with the two of them and everyone in their office. So thank you so much, ma'am, for being here as well. To Dwight Sullivan, you heard his title. You know what they say, the longer your title, 
the more important you are, absolutely, with Dwight. Dwight is a great friend, a retired Marine Corps judge advocate. Uh, if you're not tracking, that uh, deals with everything for DOD general counsel, military justice related, has had a firm hand in what we're doing with our special victim counsel program. So Dwight, thanks so much for being here today as well. And finally, to, to our dear friend, a uh, friend not only of mine and of General Berger's, uh, Karen Carlisle's, but of our regiment as a whole. The fact that he is here when he's performing not only the director of the Army Staff Mission, but also the acting vice chief of staff. And you notice I said acting vice chief staff of the Army. I'm not going to promote him and get him in trouble. Uh, so he's got both of those roles, but yet still takes the time to come down and be with us for an hour. Uh, a, because he loves being with our regiment, but B, he wants to be here to support every single thing that he knows that our SVC program. So, Walt, thanks for joining us. How about a big round of applause for all of our visitors? <laughs> so, again, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, and our amazing SVC program team, welcome and thanks for joining us today. We've invited you all here to help us recognize and celebrate an unprecedented accomplishment in the never-ending quest to provide the best support for victims of specified crimes, as well as to celebrate the practice of law within our Army. Today, we commemorate 10 years of dedicated legal service to an extraordinary group of clients. These clients, as many of us know, arrive in our care amid one of the most traumatic events anyone might have to endure. And I purposefully use the words, our care, because our SVCs do not simply provide their legal expertise. They also offer their emotional intelligence, their understanding, and their empathy or compassion for their clients. It's an unfortunate reality that a large number of their clients are friends, their family members, and civilians of all of us. They span all genders and are of varied ages. They are our sons and daughters, our wives and husbands, our sisters and brothers, and they are all, unfortunately, so often the victims of the most personal and violative crimes that we prosecute in our Army. From the inception of our military justice system, our Army has pro prosecuted crimes of this ilk. During my career, and particularly over the last 20 years, I have witnessed personally the long and arduous evolution within our Army and our nation regarding how we prosecute these offenses and care for the survivors of these crimes. I'd ask you to consider just for a moment the number of revisions to Article 120 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the article which covers the varied types of sexual assault. While they have clearly proven to be legally complex and procedurally challenging, our Army and its JAG Corps have continually demonstrated, as have the other services, the flexibility and adaptability required to deal with these complicated and often thorny changes. In the process, our attorneys have engaged in some extraordinary work to ensure these cases are appropriately prosecuted and vigorously defended, but also ensuring that victims' voices are heard and offenders are held accountable when appropriate. Like many times in our nation's legal history, the Army and its sister services have truly been at the, quote, tip of the spear on an issue. Whether it be the issue of desegregation of the military in 1948, and I'll remind you five years before the U.S. Supreme Court landmark decision in Brown versus Board of Education, which is typically credited with starting the process of desegregation, or granting a right to defense counsel well before the Supreme Court decision in Gideon versus Wainwright guaranteed that entitlement, or Article 31 UCMJ warnings protecting the right against self-incrimination for the suspect of a crime. We put that into place 16 years before the Supreme Court's decision in Miranda v. Arizona created procedural safeguards for defendants, commonly referred, as we know, to as Miranda warnings. The military service have generally been far, far ahead of the American society writ large in protecting legal rights. Thus, it only makes sense that the same would occur in prosecuting sexual assault and other similar specified offenses. As a result, we have witnessed the unique point in history in the prosecution of these offenses. But we have also stood and continue to stand at a unique point in history in caring for the survivors of these crimes. The victims are not just names in an investigation or on a chart sheet. As we all know well, they are human faces, individuals just like us, significantly impacted by these crimes. In many cases, their lives are irrevocably changed by the incidents that form the basis of these charges in these cases. And many times, these crimes actually rob these victims of control over these changes. 
but the creation, funding, manning, and empowerment of initiatives like the Special Victims Council Program strive to deliver and to return some of that control back to victims. Through their SVC, victims not only have an expert on our legal system to guide them through what may very well be or they find uh, confusing and stressful and difficult to navigate, but they also have a steadfast, outright advocate on their side. They receive counsel, experienced and educated in the law, who not only stands beside them, but also stands up for them and zealously advocates for them and their interests. The Army's SVC program and those of our sister services offer individual clients a benefit unmatched, I believe, in any civilian jurisdiction. While I clearly recognize that other jurisdictions are also developing efforts to assist sexual assault and other victims, none, I believe none, are as uniform and robust as, as what exists in our military justice system. So we, yet again, stand as a shining example to the rest of American society in this critical area. We have indeed moved from being purely reactive to client care, often far too late in the process, to being proactive in assisting them during every step of the process. I will readily admit, as many of you have heard me say before, that when this idea was initially floated, when I was the core SJ at Fort Hood, I was not, at first, overwhelmingly in, in favor of it, and I don't believe that I was alone. I thought that if a trial counsel or a special victim prosecutor was doing their job, his or her job properly, they were wrapping their arms around their victim, caring for him or her, they were, uh, and helping them navigate and better understand the military justice process. What I clearly underestimated was the victim's reaction to having their own attorney, not someone from the prosecution or defense, but someone who could solely represent their interest and theirs alone, both outside of court as well as within. Trust in our system skyrocketed as a result, and our SVCs were also able to assist victims with a range of other matters, primarily in the legal assistance arena. The program thus took off and has only gotten better with time. During this event, you will hear from one of the first practitioners in this vital area and two current practitioners. You'll first hear from Major Kate Matroka, a phenomenal field grade officer currently assigned to OTJAG administrative law here in the Pentagon, the crucible of the Pentagon. Kate attended the very first Special Victims Advocate course in 2013. In what was a newly created role, she was not only a trailblazer who made a different for, difference for her clients daily, but she also made a difference for the perception of the program, asserting that it should be called Special Victims Council instead of Advocate to clearly delineate that personnel in these roles are attorneys, not just advocates. Then you will hear from Captain Natisse Bankston, who is currently an SVC at Joint Base lewis McCord and has been an SVC since 2021. Natisse joined the JAG Corps specifically to serve as an SVC, and I know that she has found the program incredibly fulfilling, both personally and professionally, and that's absolutely awesome. Her infectious interest in and devotion to the SVC program is standard among her talented colleagues and explains her individual success and that of the program overall. And finally, you're here from Captain Ryan Sperry, a current SVC at Fort Liberty who serves as the Eastern Regional Manager. In this role, he supervised over 30 SVCs, including a participant in our very own civilian pilot program. I was incredibly excited to approve this unique pilot program in July of this year, which gives victims additional options for SVC services and can provide what had been missing in the program, that continuity of counsel that previously didn't exist. I was fortunate to observe Ryan last year in the performance of his duties as regional manager at Fort Liberty when we watched him mentor younger SVCs as well as interact with a host of other stakeholders on the installation to include the relatively new form, newly formed fusion cell. The relationships that he had built, the oversight and guidance he provided, and his resulting achievements were extraordinary. And Ryan's going to share his significant experiences in the program uniquely informed by his status as a former defense counsel and a trial counsel within our MJ system. I'm proud to stand among these three extremely skilled, caring, and passionate officers, and I'm immensely proud of what our SVC program has accomplished over its first decade. As my own career is in its twilight, I look forward to seeing where this impactful and important program heads in the coming years. I'm absolutely certain that we are on the right side of history with our tremendous efforts, and this thought is only buoyed 
by the sage words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, and I quote, those who stand up for justice will always be on the right side of history. Yet, as our stellar program and our people, as stellar as our program and people are, we simply cannot become complacent. Despite all of the accomplishments for victims, ensuring their rights and their proper care over the last decade, much work remains. But I'm supremely confident that Ms. Karen Carlisle and her role as D Director of Soldier and Family Legal Services and Colonel Eva McGinley and each future individual who serves as the program manager for the SVC program and all current and future SVCs will proudly and zealously carry the mantle of their roles and continuously seek improvements to the program, its services, and ultimately to the level of care and counsel that we provide. So while this day serves as a rightful celebration of the SVC's initial formation 10 years ago, when we began building the program aircraft literally in flight and its immense achievements thus far, may we ever have our eyes focused on the future and in that process remember that history has its eyes on us. Thank you again for joining us today and special thanks to all of our SVCs and program leads past and present, many who are in the audience today. I wish you even greater success in the next 10 years, but I also pray that the very need for such a program wanes significantly over time, given our Army's extensive prevention efforts that are already underway. And as always, I'll meet you on the high ground. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much. The Special Victims Council mission began 10 years ago. The United States Air Force established the first Special Victims Council program in January 2013. The Secretary of Defense subsequently directed all the services to establish SVC programs in August of that same year. By 1 November 2013, the Army's Special Victims Council Assistance Program, now known as the Special Victims Council Program, was fully operational. Originally known as Special Victim Advocates, these judge advocates were provided guidance to simply advocate for their clients. And in those early days, did so without a handbook for guidance. The program began with just 42 active duty Special Victim Advocates. We'll now hear from our first SVC speaker, Major Kate Matroka. Not only is she our first speaker, but Major Matroka is also a veteran of the first days of the Army's SVC program and one of our first special victim advocates. Thank you, Captain Dorfman, sir. It's an honor to be here. 10 years and two months ago, I was Captain Kate Matroka, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in my very first duty station here in MDW. I had been in the Army just shy of 18 months, and I was coming off of a year-long assignment having been a staff attorney for the WikiLeaks trial with Bradley Manning, excuse me, Private Manning. I was feeling very excited to be starting my time as an official trial counsel. That was not to be, at least not yet. One beautiful fall day, not unlike today, my SJA called me into his office and said, I've got some news. I said, what's that, sir? He said, I need an SVA, and you're it. I said, what's that, sir? <laughs> he said, good question. When you find out, let me know. <laughs> Joking aside, he said to me, I know you were excited to be a trial counsel. And then he went on to reference the congressional efforts and the Air Force program that Captain Dorfman just mentioned. And he said, we need one, too and I'm asking you to be it. And I said, Roger, sir, absolutely. And that was that. We were off to the races. Joined shortly thereafter by then Captain Stacy Cohen, I spent the next six weeks traveling all around MDW, from Fort Hamilton to Fort Walker, interfacing with stakeholders in and outside the military, commanders, law enforcement, victim support personnel, medical providers, soldiers. We hadn't written our handbook yet, and we had no regulation. So we coordinated, and we collaborated, and we used our best judgment. 
About two to three weeks later, then Lieutenant Colonel Jay McKee came on board as the first program manager. He said to us, tell me what you need and I'll underwrite it. Just over a month after being asked to be an SVA, I was in Charlottesville for the first official SVC course. Because we'd spent several weeks already setting up shop and conducting outreach and even taking on clients, I was asked to share the experiences I had so far had and the lessons we'd learned. It was my privilege to spend those days engaging with peers who were facing the same new challenges. On the last day of the course, on the stairs in room 100 at T. Jaglix, I found Lieutenant Colonel McKee and I said, sir, I've talked to everyone here and it confirms the experience I've, we've already had. You can't call us special victim advocates. People think we're part of the SHARP program, but they know trial counsel. They know defense counsel. We have to be special victim counsel. He looked at me, said, that makes sense turned on his heel, walked down to the front of room 100, and on the very last day of our very first course, in front of everyone said, I hope you haven't made your business cards yet because you're all special victim counsel. Now I share these two anecdotes to give you a sense of what it was like for practitioners in those early days. But the stories represent more than that. They reveal the profound impact that this experience of being an SVC had on my own professional development and life. What a lesson in leadership it was to be entrusted not only to do, but also to help inform and shape a program that was so important to our core, to our lawmakers, and to some of the most vulnerable members of our community. What an important lesson in leadership it was to have the leaders around me, from my immediate supervisor and partner, to my DSJA, who became my raider and my mentor, to the program manager and even the commanding general, say to this junior judge advocate, we trust you, we support you. Now own this and tell us what you need. The insight and practice my time as an SVC afforded me made me a better military justice practitioner later, in later years. The leadership examples and the experience thinking strategically and organizationally, I hope made me a better and more prepared leader. And the opportunity that the JAG Corps and the SVC program afforded to take responsibility and to make a difference continue to be things that I emphasize to potential JAG Corps accessions in my work as a field screening officer. It is remarkable what a group of dedicated individuals who are asked to show up and to step up can do when they are trusted and resourced to succeed. Like so many endeavors in this army of ours, the force behind that effort was trust. It is the same force that binds us together from foxholes to courtrooms and makes our system work. It inspires and develops young professionals like myself. It enables our organization to meet the challenges our representatives and our leaders set for us. And perhaps most of all, it allows us to empower and defend the voiceless. Though I'm sure we all wish this program weren't necessary. So long as sexual assault continues in our society, survivor advocacy will continue to be important. I am honored to have been a part of the pro this program in its infancy. I look forward to see where it goes. I take this opportunity to say thank you. Thank you to the practitioners who poured so much of themselves into this meaningful work. Thank you to the leaders who supported them and thank you to the survivors who trusted us. By 2014, the Army SVC program expanded eligibility to reserve component victims as well as child victims. Over the next few years, Congress expanded victims' rights to include the right to use extraordinary writs to enforce a victim's Article VI Bravo right. Similarly, Congress also extended eligibility for SVC services to Department of Defense civilians and domestic violence victims. As Lieutenant General Risch mentioned, a victim's right to a legal advocate is unique to the military justice system and has inspired others to join as advocates for victims. 
Our next speaker, Captain Natisse Bankston, is currently an SVC at Joint Base Lewis McCord. She learned about the SVC program prior to joining the Drag Corps and was driven to serve, in particular, as an SVC. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be with you this afternoon to mark this very special point in our JAG Army's history and the JAG Corps. Um, I'm especially happy to be able to welcome my family that made the trip down here to the Pentagon to celebrate with us. Um, like Captain Dorfman said, I am Captain Natis Bankston, I'm currently serving at the Joint Base Lewis McCord hub for the Special Victims Council program as a senior SVC. Um, I've been there since May of 2021. Um, and if some of you are doing the math, that does make it almost 29 months of me serving as an SBC or two and a half years. Um, so I'm also probably in the running for longest serving SBC. Um, some of you may also be wondering how I did that since the requirement is only for 18 months. Um, and the answer is that I love being an SBC. Um, my office and the Western region know my calling card of welcome to SBC land. Um, I'll take you back to the beginning of my journey to kind of explain what I mean by SBC land. I first learned about the JAG, about the SBC program when I was in law school um, as an educational delay ROTC student, um, going through externships, internships, FSO interviews, networking events, all the things you do to become a JAG officer. Um, when I learned there were attorneys out there who were representing victims in court in a way no one else had ever been allowed to do. And I said to myself, that's a miracle, and however possible, I have to be a part of that. I also have to get selected for the JAG Corps to do that. Um, I got selected, um, and I was a member of the inaugural, inaugural um, COVID-19 OBC at the start of the pandemic in 2020. <laughs> Different story, won't even go into it. Um, but I got my wish at my first duty station when I arrived and talked to my deputy. They asked, what job have you been dying to do? And I immediately said, SBC. My SBC, my SJA trusted me and allowed me to take on this elusive and infamously challenging job, um, a brand new JAG, a brand new attorney, really my first true step in my career. Um, as an added challenge, I was seven months pregnant at the start of my job. Um, so yes, it seemed daunting, it was definitely scary, but I cared about this job so much that I had to take the chance. Um, I was fully aware of how difficult it would probably be, especially because I was someone who always feels everyone and everything around me very deeply and very personally, but I knew it was important. I knew I had to figure out a way to navigate my own emotions, my new role as a parent, an officer in the Army, an attorney, in an effective way to be an SVC for my clients. Um, I figured out how to use my own sensitivity as to the world as a point of connection and validation for my clients in their very real questions, their concerns, and feelings. I remained true to myself, um, and I always ensured them that I was always upfront and honest, and I would always be willing to ask the question. I removed the fear of being judged for asking the stupid question, and it was all for the betterment of my clients' goals and understanding. I felt that I owed that to them to ask the question. I was able to use my novice curiosity as a bridge between my clients and their cases. Um, I ultimately took on the attitude of, if you don't ask, you won't receive, and the worst thing that can happen is that you get a no. Um, I can report that this role, um, particularly in the beginning, was unequivocally exciting, but also and certainly not easy. Um, I distinctly remember one of the first times I accompanied a client to a CID interview. Um, at the time, our work was so new um, that I think law enforcement wasn't quite sure what to make of us at the time. They were so used to seeing um, suspects with representations and, att and attorneys, but not used to seeing a victim with representation. Um, and because we were doing something so new, something that the rest of the criminal justice system across of the country really had not ever done before, and definitely not on this scale, um, that caused some inevitable challenges. Um, but despite all those initial hiccups, we ended up making a great partnership, um, and I worked closely every day with CID. Um, it was a genuine team effort to get to that point, uh, to be the best, for our, best point for our clients. We worked hand in hand with our partners in this venture, law enforcement, prosecution, defense, um, social work services, a whole team dedicated not to just ensuring that justice is done, but that we produce the best possible outcome for the military justice system, which includes the best possible care for our victims. 
somehow it all worked out um, and I didn't know, but my regional manager let me know that at some point I was being requested by name to be SBC for different victims on a, on a mostly weekly bracelet basis. Um, that was a shock for me, but it was also the epitome of what I believe is that anything is possible in SBC land. Um, it could be easy for an SBC to feel insignificant in comparison to defense counsel, prosecution, the judge, um, and SBCs may feel burnt out because of the emotional requirement of this role. However, despite those very real concerns, this experience has quite literally sparked the thought and mindset and fire in me that is anything is possible as an SBC and in our JAG Corps uh, writ large. Our relatively young practice and highly specialized um, highly specialized legal counsel affords us the unique opportunity to continuously shape our, our practice to benefit our clients and our military justice system in order to give victims of sexual abuse their proper voice. It is a privilege to serve my clients as an SVC. We get to push the issues. We get to think outside the box. And more importantly, we get to care unapologetically for our duty and for our clients. And as an SBC, you get to do all of those things and be doing your job exactly right. And that's the magic of SBC land. I am forever grateful to be able to say I was a part of this trailblazing and passion-driven collection of attorneys who were trusted to advocate for the individuals who selflessly volunteered to serve this country. Thank you. The SVC program has resulted not just in exceptional support for our clients, but also exceptional experience for the judge advocates and paralegals who dedicate themselves to this mission. Working with commanders, law enforcement, victim advocates, prosecutors, and defense counsel, SVCs and SVC paralegals have the unique opportunity to holistically see the military justice system. Our SVCs not only gain valuable legal experience, but also the Army recognizes the value the SVC program and practice brings to our victim clients. To increase support to victims and to SVCs alike, the Army created the regional manager role to provide supervision and technical advice to field SVCs in 2018. In this role and supported by SVC paralegals, majors and senior captains lead, coach, and mentor special victims counsel and paralegals across their region and around the world. Currently, there are five regions, and in the coming year, the SVC program will expand to eight. Our last speaker is Captain Ryan Sperry, who currently serves as the Eastern Regional Manager based at Fort Liberty, North Carolina. Having managed both seasoned SVCs and SVCs recently certified, Captain Sperry has incredible insight to the SVC practice today and a view looking forward to what the SVC program holds for the future. Thank you so much for the introduction, sir. It's an honor to be here. Now, to give some context, I've been doing this job, the, recent, the regional manager job, for about 16 months now. And before becoming an RM, I had never been an SVC before. And I was tasked with leading, supervising, mentoring SVCs in the field. A challenge. But I thought I knew what SVCs did. I had been in military justice for quite some time. I had seen the system from multiple angles, and so I thought I knew what SVCs did day in and day out for their clients, or at least I imagined I did. Before assuming this role, I had been a defense counsel for two years, and so I worked with SVCs and their clients, doing pretrial interviews, leading up to trial, cross-examining their clients at trial, trying to sell their clients on favorable alternative dispositions, before doing that, I was a trial counsel and an MJA. So I worked with victims, worked with SVCs during investigations, during disposition preference discussions, 
and obviously prepping for and at trial. But all that said, it was not until assuming this job that I fully understood and fully appreciated the work that SVCs do. I never fully understood or appreciated the unique challenge day in and day out that our SVCs have to handle. Now, certainly the skills that I learned as a defense counsel were transferable to the SVC role. Knowing how to communicate with and talk to someone who was going through perhaps the most singularly stressful, challenging, and taxing event in their life. How do you talk to that person? How do you help them navigate an all too often opaque military justice system? And that is the job that our SVCs do every day. It's a heavy burden to have to take on the trust and the stress and the trauma that our clients have to a single, to a single one experienced. And expecting an SVC to shoulder that burden, it's not easy. But it's one that our SVCs are uniquely positioned to shoulder. They have been hand-selected by their leadership because of their experience, their judgment, their maturity, and their competence. Our SVCs do incredible work. They zealously advocate for their clients. They exercise the autonomy and the independence that is expected of them. They collaborate with our government and defense counsel colleagues when doing so is in their clients' best interests, all while maintaining the highest standard of professional conduct. I am incredibly proud of the SVCC teammates that I have worked with and had the good fortune to lead as their regional manager. To a one, they are dedicated and committed professionals doing an all too often underappreciated yet incredibly challenging job. Some asked to be assigned as SVCs, many didn't, but they all recognize that they are part of a cohesive team doing a unique and vital mission. It is their work and this mission that increases the faith and confidence that our victims and observers have in our military justice system. And I consider myself extremely fortunate to be a part of this work. We have a phenomenal team within the Eastern Region, here at the program office, and supportive SJAs who recognize and value the importance of the SVC mission. Now, looping back to my initial statement, I've seen the military justice system from multiple angles at this point, multiple perspectives. The victim's perspective is the one I came to last. However, I have come to recognize that it is often the most important of these perspectives. As a society, an insular society that purports to have an interest in perpetuating a system of justice that considers the voices of all stakeholders, we must not forget that of the victim. Because when the sun sets on the courthouse, we've all gone home and the dust has settled, it is the victim who will be left with the lasting impacts, the lasting scars of their experience. How do we make that person whole? Should we even try? These are tough questions, but it gets to the heart of our values and our mission as a JAG Corps. Again, I am humbled and proud to be a part of an organization, the SVC program, whose very existence is evidence of our commitment to those goals and those values. Thank you. The SVC program has had a busy and successful first decade. We have grown to include approximately 60 full-time Special Victims Council and 17 SVC paralegals. Since 2013, the Judge Advocate General has certified over 1,300 Judge Advocates to serve as Special Victims Council. More importantly, SVCs have represented over 15,000 victims, appeared in over 2,000 courts martial, 
and have filed 15 writs with the appellate courts. What an incredibly successful first 10 years. To close our commemoration, I introduce you to Ms. Karen Carlisle, the Director of Soldier Family Legal Services. As the director, Ms. Karen Carlisle. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am. Ms. Carlisle currently supervises the SVC program, including SVC training, development, and certification. Previously, Ms. Carlisle, then Colonel Carlisle, and a staff judge advocate witnessed the development of the SVC program and the transformation of the Army's victim legal advocacy over the years. Now, Ms. Carlisle directs and guides this nuanced area of law while ensuring victims continue to receive the gold standard of legal support. Thank you, Kristen. I think you raised this like you were much taller than me. But um, uh, so th th that's what happens when you didn't read all through the script. I'm like, it's my turn. Um, and so, so thank you so much. Um, General Risch for hosting, General Pyatt for taking the time out, Ms. Council Ross. Uh, it's tough to be the closer uh, after <laughs> such great speeches. Um, and no, not the People's MLO. Um, <laughs> good to see you, People's MLO, Senior Defense Council, Chairman's Legal, and our great NGB teammates. Regimental, you as well. You got called out earlier. So it's okay. Um, and our team. Um, and, and it is tough to be after such great speakers. Really, um, back to what TJAG said at the beginning, right? Which is just honored to be part of such a dedicated uh, team to our victims. Uh, and they make you think, thank goodness that we have this program. Uh, and they are a critical part of the military justice team giving voice to our clients. Um, as long as, you know, we have Kate talking about shaping the program from the very beginning. And I think an anniversary makes you look back at the past. I literally am standing on my toes, by the way. Um, <laughs> it makes you look back at the past. Um, and, and I was an SJA, um, you know, kind of General Risch in October of 2013. I was a staff judge advocate of First Armor Division in Fort Bliss. Renault was my deputy. Um, and we got the phone call that said, you know, implement this. Uh, and so we looked around and said, oh, okay, it's not like you have a bunch of spare captains running around. Um, are you going to send me somebody? And the answer to that was no. Um, I said, okay. Um, and so then Fort Bliss was the home of every married Army couples program, I think, JAG Corps couple in the Army. Blake was there. He can attest. So then I had to find somebody who didn't conflict, right? There was no conflicts. Um, but we made the program work, and Kate, you, you spoke about that so well. And then we learned about uh, Natisa's uh, SVC land, uh, right? And that's about the teamwork, and that's about making sure that we have a, the, the focus and the vision to take care of our clients um, who are vulnerable, who are in not a great place. And that goes back to what Ryan said, right, which is really bringing it all back to it's an critical part of the military justice system. It's what makes it work right now, right, is making sure that our victims are taken care of. And so we are 10 years old, uh, but we are also 10 years young. And so what are we going to do? And so I look at some of our previous program managers here. We have Elizabeth Murata. We have Lance Hamilton, uh, our current SBC program manager, Eva McGinley, right? And each one of them had came in and made a difference and made changes and made our program better. We went from a, you know, an infant to a toddler. Now we're school age. We're moving on, um, right? But, but we're going to make changes, and we continue to make uh, things that are better for our victims and for our program, including moving from five regions to eight regions to mirror the OSTIC, the Office of the Special Trial Counsel. We're working on hiring an appellate counsel to represent our victims at the appellate level, a next step. And as TJAG mentioned, a civilian pilot program um, to take, to do some continuity to support uh, our victims in a different and better way. And so with that, I just want to thank everyone who's currently serving as an SVC, who's previously served as an SVC, and those of you who don't know yet, but you will be an SVC. <laughs> um, right? 
Uh, thank you for what you do every day for the Army, for our clients, uh, and uh, for the military justice system. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our commemoration event. We invite you to join us for refreshments immediately following in the atrium. Thank you again for your attendance and your support of the SVC program over the last decade and the future.